Now I have a video to go through. I'm going to go through quite a few here, actually, but majority of the normal distribution chapter. So this is chapter three of the Stats and Mechanics book. Uh, and this, I believe, is 3.3. So in a previous video, I did 3.1, 3.2, which was the introduction to normal and also how to use your calculator to find the probabilities using the normal uh, distribution itself. Uh, for this one, I'm going to be using the calculator to use the inverse normal uh, and going through um, the calculator to, to basically find these. We'll then go on to finding the mean and standard deviation using um, simultaneous equations. I'm just going to, I'm not going to teach this in this video. I'm going to go through the examples and talk through. Um, so I'm not actually doing the examples themselves. But yeah, so we've got inverse, we've got standard normal, we've got finding um, the mean and standard deviation. After that, we've got um, approximate and binomial uh, distribution using the normal. And then finally, we'll have hypothesis testing. So I'm just going to go through all of those. Now, I'll likely just do one example on each, and I'll try and timestamp it just so you can flick through. But here we go. The masses mkg of a population of badgers are modelled as uh, m, approximate by or modelled by, sorry, normal distribution with mean of 4.5 and standard deviation 0.6. For this population, find the lower quartile, the 80th percentile, and explain without calculation why Q2 is 4.5. So we're going to go through all of these, um, may, mainly with the calculator, to be fair. So it's all very much on calculator. And for a lot of this, we're going to be using um, menu 7, which is distributions. And then we're going to be looking at the inverse normal. So that's number 3. So a lot of this will be on this setting here. I say a lot of it, all of it. So for this one, I'm just going to talk about uh, the model first of all. So this model, we've got the mean. And we've got the standard deviation just on this side, technically the variance squared. So we know firstly the mean is equal to 4.5 and the standard deviation is equal to 0.6. We'll be using that in a second. For A, the lower quartile. So what we're thinking about here, so the inverse normal in your calculator, first of all, let's just talk about how that works just so you've got that. Um, the inverse normal in your calculator will look at the probability of X being less than little x and that's equal to some area. So the area is your probability of that happening. But notice how I've put less than here. It will only do less than. So what I mean by this is if you're looking for less than 10%, so this part here, then the probability of this being 10% is what I'm, I'm talking about here. That will be 0 0.1. That's the area. So this value here where it takes place, that's little x. And that's what we're trying to find when we do the inverse normal. So when you put these values in, it's got to be less than. So why is this important? Well, in some questions, you'll want to work at the top end. So you'll want to know whereabouts is this area here, 0.1. But we're not going to put that into our calculator. We'll be using the other area. So remember, the total area under this curve is equal to 1. So the kind of area here that's not colored will be 0.9. And it's that area that we put in our calculator to find this x. It'll become more clear in a second especially, um, actually, maybe not on this question. So I'm just having a look at this one. But I'll talk about it anyway, and I'll, I'll show you. Uh, so I'll show you the difference of what's happening here. I'll just get rid of all that, and we'll bring this in. So for part A, we're looking for the lower quartile. So first of all, we, we should recognize that the lower quartile is the bottom 25%. So the mean takes place in the middle. So that's 50% now each side of that. The lower quartile takes place down here, so that's Q1, um, and it's where this area here represents 25%. So remember, the quartiles will split all of our data into bottom 25%, the middle 50% of the interquartile range, and then the top 25%. Um, so in between each of these quartiles, we've got 25% of the data. So this area here is 0.25. So all I want to do on my calculator to find what my Q1 is the probability, in this case, is M, is less than Q1, we know must be equal to 0 0.25. So this Q1 is what I'm looking for. Putting this in my calculator will tell me that Q1. So my area, 0 0.25. 
My standard deviation was 0 0.6 from the question, and my mean was 4.5 from the question. And all I'm going to do is press equals. So 4.0953. That's going to be my Q1. So Q1 equals 4.09. And this was given to 1DP, so I should say 4.9. Uh, 4.09. I'm just going to go to kind of a few decimal places for now. If I wanted the upper quartile, so just on a kind of sidestep from this, if I wanted the upper quartile, just so you get this, this idea, then the upper quartile takes place where this area is 25 or 0.25. Now, obviously, if I go back and I put that in, well, this is the same information and it's still giving me this 4.09. So it's always giving me that lower end. So the information I need to give my calculator is what's underneath the value I'm looking for. And that's going to be 0.75 because that's the area that's left. If I put that in, we get 4.904. And I just want to show you what the significance of this is. So the lower quartile was down here. That was 4.095. And the median was right in the middle at 4.5. You just quickly, well, firstly, bear with me while I swap onto this. If I just calculate the difference between these two numbers, so 4.5, minus 4.095, that's 81 over 200 or 0.405 going below. If I add that back to 4.5, you'll see that this is my upper quartile. So it's symmetrical. Um, so it's perfectly symmetrical about this, which is the nature of the normal distribution anyway. So we can use the uh, kind of that properties of symmetry to try and help us here, or just using the knowledge that it's going to be the other uh, error, the error below the number we want that we put in our calculator. I'll just go back into where I want to be. There we go. If that doesn't make sense, just let me know and I'll go through it again. But remember, it's the area under the value we want that we put into the inverse normal. The other kind of functions, so seven and two, this one we get to put in a lower and upper bound. So we can actually choose where we want this area to be. For the inverse normal, you don't get that luxury. You've got to understand what your calculator is requesting. Part B, we want the 80th percentile. So if we want 80th percentile, we want 80% of the data to be underneath the curve. So this time, when we're looking at the 80th, it's all the way up here, and we want to know all of this bit. So 80% under there. So obviously that is going to be 0 0.8. So I want to know where is the probability that M is less than the 80th percentile. I want to know when that is equal to 0 0.8. So I'm, I'm looking for that. 80th percentile here um, and if we can give that a name we can call it p8 80 p8 there's different kind of ways um, i'm going to call it p80 for now so that's the 80th percentile um, i'm just going to put that in here so 0 0.8 equals 0 0.6 4.5 and then just hit equals so 5.0049. Notice how that's bigger than the 75th percentile I count calculated a second ago or the upper quartile because it's slightly further up uh, than where we were. So the 80th percentile is equal to 5.00. And then this time it's going to be five, I suppose. And finally, C, explain without calculation why Q2 is 4.5 kg. Well, have a look at the question. It's given to us right in the question. We know if a standard uh, for a uh, normal distribution that the mean is the mode is the median. It takes place right at the center. So Q2 must be 4.5 because it's the same as the mean. Uh, so and that's what we want to say here. So in Q2, we know that the median is equal to mu, which is equal to 4.5. And that's enough information for that one. Okay, so finding the, oh, in fact, give me one second, this is the wrong page. That's bad. Uh, so the standard normal, this is uh, the next kind of bit in this chapter. The standard normal, let's just have a quick explain, a, a explanation about what the standard normal is. So what we've been doing so far is just normal distributions. We've been looking at data that can be modeled normally. Uh, now we're going to look at something known as the standard normal. So this is a process that standardizes all data such that the normal distribution itself, the curve, can map to the same normal distribution curve where the mean, the central number is zero, and the standard deviation, so one standard deviation away from this, being equal to one. 
So one and minus one each side technically is minus standard deviation and plus standard deviation. So this takes all data and basically tries to fit it or, or it does fit it to this model. Um, and it uses a formula to do so. So this is known as Z. Um, so here, what we're going to say here is Z is equal to, it's our X value minus mu divided by standard deviation. And that will basically take our, our own personal data that we want um, and we put it into this formula and it will, it will change it such that we can map it to this curve. And this was really useful actually back, back when we used to use uh, tables to look this up. Now we've got a calculator, it kind of just does it for us. Um, we still do need, need this a little bit for one or two questions, but only because the examiners force us to learn this effectively. It doesn't really hold too much um, value for us anymore because there's, there's plenty of um, calculators and technology out there that helps us do this. So for part A, I'm just going to talk through a little bit about kind of how to use this and what it's doing. On a calculator, it's really useful, though, because when you go into a calculator, it immediately tells you one and zero. It's always set at being the standard normal. So it's really quick to put information in. And it's likewise for the inverse normal. It's always set ready for us to be able to use. So this can really help us when, when finding out information. Um, to do it quickly on the calculator, but then you've still got to do a calculation beforehand. So is it really that useful? Not in my opinion. Um, it, it's just forced upon us. So use the percentage points table to find the value of Z such that P of Z less than Z is equal to 0.15. So the percentage points table is actually in your formula book. I'm just going to bring up the excerpt now, and then we can have a look at that. So I'll just get that now. And there's the kind of bit that you're giving your uh, formula, but there is a, a little bit that I need to just add on to this, um, not by jumping screens. Uh, so it's the fact that this is greater than, so this is the probability that Z is greater than, and then whatever these are. So in this case, it's a uh, little Z. So the probability, I said to look exactly the same, uh, is equal to P. So whatever P is in this table, so 50% is greater than zero. That's what that's talking about. Let's just go through a little bit of this is that if I just draw in my mean there of zero, that you've got 50% of data that's above that. If I draw in Z as being 0.253, that's going to be here because it's bigger than, then the amount of data that's now shaded here would be equivalent of 0.4, which is 40%. So that area right there would be 0.4. And that just keeps going through this table. So you can see when we get right to the end, where Z is absolutely tiny as... 0.0000005. Oh, I don't want Z, I want P. Uh, when Z is 3.2905, the area, if I shade that, obviously this should have come down, but this area here should be absolutely tiny. Uh, and in actual fact, if my pen will let me actually, it thinks I'm. It's not allowing me to colour because it thinks I'm double clicking. There we go. Um, this area here is 0 0.0005. So it's absolutely tiny. Um, but you can see that's where this comes from. So sometimes we might need these. Um, generally speaking, you can use your calculator to get these anyway. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of come from there. So I'll, I'll show you from the percentage points table because that's what it's asking. And I'll show you how you could possibly find that from your calculator too. So in this one, uh, we want to know where it's 0.15. So we're looking for P. So notice how it's 0.15 is equivalent of P here. So we look in the P table for 0.15, which is this one. And then we're going to pull out that Z value. Uh, we want to know where Z is less than Z though. So this particular one is telling us where it's greater than Z. So right here, I've got my 15%. That's this bit colored. That represents 0.15. And I know that that's equivalent of 1.0364. So in other words, where the mean is zero, it's 1.0364 above that to get this 15%. That's where it's bigger than Z. I want to know whereabouts it's less than. So I want to know the probability of Z being less than Z. And for that, we're going to use the fact that it is symmetrical. So... The fact that this is symmetrical just means if I go one this way, 1.0364, and I've got 15%, if I go the same distance this way, 
I get the same number, but I'll be able to find this, this part here, which is below another Z value. In our case, it's going to be minus 1.0364. And that's going to be my answer here. So Z is equal to uh, minus 1.0364. And it's just using this uh, symmetry of that. On our calc, we could simply just go inverse normal. Our area is 0.15. And I just press equals because this is already set up for the standard. And you can see right there, it does it for us. So is it really worthwhile knowing this table? Uh, that's the kind of the, the question here. Uh, if I wanted this 40% above, if I want 40% below, same idea. I put in 0.4 and I should get the negative of this, which is minus 0.2533, as you can see. Um, obviously, if I want to get these tables, these values from the table, then 40% above is the same as 60% below. And this should give me the 0.2533, but positive, which it does. So I can get all this information straight from my calculator. Um, I can even get even more accurate if I want 25 or, I don't know, 22, which is not in this table. Um, and I can find that out. So my calculator still got all this information, but can be far more accurate. Um, part B. A hat manufacturer makes a special petite hat, which should fit 15% of its customers. Given that hat sizes can be modeled using a normal distribution with mean 57 and standard deviation 2, use your answer to part A to find the size of a petite hat. Well, given that we know what Z is, so here we're looking for the size of a petite hat. That is the original. So we know the formula for Z is whatever X is minus mu over standard deviation. We know Z, that's minus 1.0364 from part A. We're looking for X, that's the actual real value we want, that's the uncoded value. But we know that it's got a mean of 57, and we know it's got a standard deviation of 2. So all I want to do is unwind this to find my answer. So I'm going to take my minus 1.0364, I'll times it by 2, and then I will add 57 to that. And that is the size of the petite hat. So X is equal to 54.9 centimeters. So I'm just going to round that. And that's it. You can tell that's less than the mean of 57. So it makes sense that it's going to be the petite hat because it's lower. Um, so a little bit of logic there just to check should help. Um, it doesn't guarantee it's correct, of course. Um, I might have made a bodge upon putting the numbers in, but it does help us uh, recognize whether we're below or above. So if we do get a ridiculous answer, we're able to spot that straight away and go back and correct. That is a standard normal in a nutshell. Um, you do need to practice a lot more than that. I've just done one of many questions. Um, but again, the standard normal is just mean is zero and standard deviation is one. And it's using this formula, this Z kind of formula. Um, the values you get from your calculator, sorry, so it'll say this in the book, um, but when you put your, your standard values, they're called phi of Z. So it looks like this. This basically is the probabilities. So phi of Z itself, um, they're what kind of come out from the standard deviation. Um, and then we can use those to, to kind of help us. Um, I do believe it's all explained in there. Um, and we'll use that shortly anyway. Next up, we've got finding mean and standard deviation. I've tried to choose um, a question which is one of the back end harder ones. Um, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm going to guarantee that it's um, definitely like one of the kind of hardest in there. Um, but if you come across any that you find that are way harder, just let me know and I'll, I'll go through. I don't mind. So we've got an automated pottery wheel is used to make bowls. The diameter of bowls, D millimeters, is normally distributed with mean mu and standard deviation five. Given that 75% of bowls are greater than 200 millimeters in diameter, so uh, find the value of mu. So for this one, um, we're wanting to use, likely um, is best to try and use the uh, formulas we've just come across. So this Z minus uh, kind of mu of a standard deviation. These are generally um, slightly kind of makes, makes this slightly easier for us to kind of do. So from this, I just want to write out my model, first of all. So I know my model is normal. So we've got D. So for part A, before I even get to part A, I want to write down D is modeled normally. 
and it's got a normal distribution. Uh, sorry, it's modeled normally. It's got a mean of mu and standard deviation of five. So I just want to put that in first of all. So what I do, what I'm going to do here, um, you might have to do this more than once. So you might have to do it twice and, and try and figure out um, simultaneously what, what standard deviation and mu are. So this is just going to go one way. I'll see if I can dig out a question which you which uses both shortly. And technically, this should be squared, shouldn't it? There we go. So we want to find that value of mu. So let's just write out what this is saying. So given that 75% of people of bowls are greater than 200, so the probability that D is greater than 200 is equal to 0.75. That's the first thing we know here. Um, so is there anything else we can get from that? Technically, we could... Well, it just depends which, which function we're going to use here, but I, it looks like, because we've got an area, we're going to be looking at that normal kind of function um, and the inverse function, sorry, because we're going from area. So I know I'm probably going to be using the area function, but I'm looking for what that mean is, which is going to be a bit of a problem. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to have to use a standard normal to try and help us. So what does this actually say? Well, this is stating that the probability that the diameter is less than 200, therefore, must be equal to 0.25 or 25%. Fine. Let's now convert this D variable into a Z variable. So the probability that Z is less than, in this case, we've got our 200. We need to subtract the mean and divide it by a standard deviation. And we know that's still going to be equal to this 0.25. So this is now a standard normal. So this one has a mean of one, uh, zero and a standard deviation of one for this Z variable. So we can actually find out the probability this is true. So basically 200 minus mu over five is equal to, and we can find this value. Uh, and then we can kind of unwind that. So remember, this is gonna tell us what this little Z value is if I put this in. So I'm gonna put 0.25 and then standard deviation is one and mu is zero because we've made this a standard normal. So this tells me from our calculator that Z, little Z, is equal to minus 0.674, blah, blah, blah. And remember, that's equal to this thing here. That's the formula that we've used. Little Z is equal to X minus mu over standard deviation. So that's what I'm going to put into this equation right here. I just want to unwind this to find what mu equals. So for me here, I'm going to do, if I take this, Kind of, if I times by five, first of all, let's just store this on my calculator. So I'll put that into A. If I take A and I times it by five, that's going to tell me 200 minus mu. So 200 minus mu equals this. Let's just write that down just so you can see what's happening here rather than trying to say it all out loud. Now what I want to do is I want to add mu to each side and then I'm going to take this over to this side. So basically, I'm going to get 200 plus this is equal to mu. Uh, and that's what I'm looking for here. So I can do that without the calculator. 200 plus 3 is 203.372. Uh, and it's in millimeters. So I'll just put millimeters. So that's part A. I'm running out of space. Let's just come over here. Part B is find the probability at 204 and 206, and D is between those. So I'll do B right up here. Oh, no, I won't. <laughs> I'll do B right up here see what's coming next. The probability of 204 less than D, less than 206. We've got all the information we need now. So um, you could do this using the uh, Z distribution if you're not too confident, but we've got everything we need to put in our calculators now. So if I just do 200 minus ANS, that is my um, mean. So I'm just gonna store that back to A and I can use that when it comes to putting this into my calculator. So I'm gonna go distribution normal CD, and it's asked me for a lower bound. Okay, lower can be 204, upper can be 206, and I know my standard deviation is five, given from the question, and my mu was that A value, so I'm just going to put A, and it'll bring it in, press equals, and that's it, it's finished. You can use a Z distribution to do this, but oh, what, what's the point when you can just use your calculator? Uh, so knowing how to use your calculator is really important here. If you were to do it using the Z, I just don't, I'm trying to work out why. You just don't need to. 
Um, the book itself, if you go through and you have a look at like any uh, solution banks, they probably will do it using the Z distribution, but this is worth one point. There's just no way you would want to do it using the Z. Um, if you have a look at it and you get confused, let me know. Um, but there's just no way you'd use a Z distribution for this. You just go straight in, straight into the calculator and out pops your answer. One point done. Three balls are chosen at random. Uh, find the probability that all of the balls are greater than 205 millimeters. So we've got three balls. So what's the probability that one ball is? And then we can do three balls. So because they're all independent of each other. So we want to know what's the probability that one ball or D is bigger than 205. And keep in mind, obviously, if we've got the probability of one and I want three of those doing the same thing, then I'm just going to times those probabilities together. So the overall probability is going to be whatever this is cubed. So I'm just going to find that now. So going back to my calculator, I want to know, um, this time it is a CD again. Uh, my lower limit is 205, but my upper, you can just put in a large number. The rule of thumb is to be at least five times the standard deviation. So I'd want to put in at least 200. Um, so the mean itself was, I've forgotten now, 203. So I'd want to be putting in at least 228. I'm going to put in 240 just because I know it's way above and everything else is in there. So I've got five and 203. That's from earlier. Pressing equals tells me it's 0.372. That is for just one. So that's just one ball. So the probability of doing this three times greater than 205 is the probability of one, but cubed. So again, on your calculator, I would store that number, store to B, let's say. Then I go to my menu and go back to the original, alpha B to get that number up, and then just cube that. And that gives me 0.0516. So there is a 5% chance that for these three balls chosen at random will be greater than 205. And that is finding mu and uh, standard deviation. The way that gets harder is that you'd have to do this twice and you'll have a standard deviation at the bottom. You'll then have to rearrange and solve them simultaneously. So it's the same process, but you do it twice and then you solve simultaneously. So at this stage here, you get something like 200 minus mu equals some number times standard deviation or that little cannon symbol. You'll do that twice for two different conditions and then set them um, kind of equal to each other or, or simultaneously solve to find what mu and standard deviation are. If you want one of those examples, let me know and I can post one of those separately or just tag it somewhere in here. Next part of this chapter is approximating a binomial distribution. So this is what happens um, if um, a binomial distribution, if it's quite symmetrical, we can use a normal distribution, try and approximate it. So effectively, when we've got a large enough N for binomial, and it doesn't have to be massive, um, but we just say large enough, Greater than 50 ideal, but as soon as the probability of this binomial distribution becomes um, close to 0 0.05, what you end up with is a distribution which starts to become a little kind of like a normal distribution. Bad picture on my part there. But um, you get the idea. So you, you get these kind of um, probabilities that increase towards the center and then decrease going back down towards the edge and when we fit a normal to that it kind of fits in uh, and it fits in really nicely without going over if you've got a skewed one then we'd have to skew the distribution but what often happens is um when we skew it it just doesn't quite fit so i still need to make that symmetrical um it doesn't quite fit and you get these massive kind of gaps. So it becomes less accurate. You can still use it. It's just far less accurate. So the condition here is we want um, N to be greater than 50 ideally and P to be approximately 0.5. Whatever your question gives you, that's just the way it's going to go. Um, sometimes it'll be when N is quite small. Sometimes it'll be uh, when P is like 0. 0. 0. kind of 0.25. It, it just depends but you can still use it, it's just less accurate. And they might ask you to reflect on that. So that's what something to keep in mind. 
The other thing to keep in mind is how we change this. So this is obviously done on a binomial distribution where we've got n and p. What happens is we convert that to a normal distribution, but the normal distribution is a little bit different because it's based on np as being the mean and the square root of what I call npq, where q is basically uh, 1 minus p. Um, it just makes this a little bit nicer. Um, so that is the kind of the opposite of what the probability is. So if the probability of something happens 0.4, then the probability doesn't happen is 0.6. And that's what we kind of times in there. We're square rooting that itself because this is the variance. Um, and then we technically want to square that up. So when I come to put this in, it'll look something like that or simply just MPQ there. Um, but to get the um, standard deviation, we'll need to square root that, um, which is the one that's really important here. So it's uh, it's technically this, but the better way to write it would be to kind of square root that so you remember, and then just square it on the outside. So this is the actual standard deviation. So for the normal itself, let's just put on here, that mean is NP, and that uh, canon is the square root of N. P, Q, just so we've got that, and I'll refer to that shortly. Um, anything else? Not massively. We need to talk about technically about the what we call the continuity correction. Um, and this is just because the binomial is a discrete function, whereas the bin uh, sorry, the normal is a continuous variable. So in binomial, it could take only certain values like not one, two, three. And there are great examples in the book that try and demonstrate this. But when we come to make that continuous, like in a, a normal distribution, we need to be sure that we account for that. So for example, let's say in your normal, in your binomial distribution, you've got, let's just do like three or four bars for now, something like this. So this is zero, one, two, three. When we can come to fit a, normal distribution to this so something looks like that this is now continuous so the the values for the normal distribution can take everything so if i wanted it to be let's say the probability where um, x is bigger than one this would be in our uh, binomial function so we use x for the original function and we convert this to x bar for our uh, converter type function so for our actual um, normal. You can say x um, kind of, actually, we're not going to use x bar. We're going to use x bar next. Ignore that last sentence. We're going to convert it to y. I'm getting mixed up in the next chapter for some, some reason. Uh, so y is bigger than something, but I don't know what it is. If I want it to be bigger than one, then in a discrete function, um, one, and you can see kind of on here that one is the bounds for upper and lower, a kind of in between zero and 1.5. If I want to be bigger than one, I can't have it going into any of this bar. So when I come to the continuous function, I need to be bigger than this, which is actually 1.5. And this is known as a continuity correction. Uh, so we're basically taking this and we're, we're accounting for the bounds. If I wanted it to be, let's just do it all on this. If I wanted it to be less than one, then I don't want it to be including any of this again. So it needs to be less than 0.5. So the continuity correction here would be less than 0.5. If I wanted it to be equal to 1, let's say, so the probability that x is 1, then in a continuous um, function, then we need it to be between these two. So it needs to be between 0 0.5 and 1.5. And these are the continuity corrections when we're going to need to make. If it's allowed to be equal to 1, then that's, again, it's going to be uh, slightly different. So if x is greater than or equal to 1, then in this case, it can be equal to the coloured in section, and I want it to be bigger. So, it, But it can also include the shader section. So it needs to be all the way down to 0 0.5 and then above. So in this one, it would be the probability of y is greater than 0 0.5. So that would also include the 1. And it's likewise if I want it to be less than or equal to 1. And this time I want to include the top bound to get that one as well. Um, so it would be the probability that y is less than 
1.5. So these are the different types of continuity corrections you can get based on this chart. Um, I'm going to leave those for now just so I can refer to it in a second. But you must do that before you use or before you do the approximation itself. So that's what we're going to look at now. So we've got a drill bit manufacturer claims that 52% of its bits last longer than 40 hours. Uh, a random sample of bits of 30 bits is taken and X lasts longer than 40 hours. We want to find the probability that X is less than 17. Okay, so where to go with this one? So um, firstly, I'm just going to write out yet again, I'm going to write down the um, binomial kind of model that I'm using. And then from there, we're going to start uh, kind of looking at what to do with this question. So for part A, before we get to part A, let's write down the model itself. So X itself is modeled binomially with 52%. That means it's 0.52 is the probability that they last 40 hours or longer. So let's look at the sample. We had 30 bits and 0.52 is the claim, so 0.52. So that's going to be our um, binomial model. So we want to use, actually, what do we want? We want finding the probability of the X. Oh, this is fine. We're going to stick with the uh, binomial model. This is just getting us used to it then. So find the probability that X is less than 17. So the probability that X is less than 17. Remember in your calculator, when you do binomials, this is like a year ago that we did this, um, to do less than, it's not actually a calculator, it doesn't do less than, it only does less than or equal to. So if you put 17 in, that means it's doing less than or equal to 17. So when I come to put this in my calculator, I'm actually going to choose, I need to be careful on the X. So the first thing I want to do here is think about what it needs to be less than or equal to. If it's less than 17, it can be less than or equal to 16 because less than 17, it includes 16, but not 17. So this is what I want to put in my calculator. So I know that X is 16, N was 30, and the probability is 0.52. So it's 0.6277. Help if I read this very briefly before I uh, started having a look at this. A second random, random sample of 600 drill bits is taken. And here's what we're learning right now. Using a suitable approximation, find the probability that between 300 and 350 bits inclusive last longer than 40 hours. So we've got 300 to 350. That is based upon our discrete. We want between 300 and 350 inclusive of those two. So we're going to have a look at how we can convert that. So we're going to start, first of all, by coming up with our um, distribution itself. Now, this it's got to be valid here, this uh, approximation itself, because n is 600 and 0.52 is definitely close to 0.5. So as uh, n is 600 and p is 0.52, so this is sufficiently large and this is close to 0.5, then a normal will work. So this implies a normal approximation. You don't have to say this to get the points. But I just want to make this clear. Um, so what is that normal approximation? Well, first thing, remember, we've got X is this binomial. We want to convert that to Y is normally distributed with mu. Mu is 30. So I need to get back into my calculation. 30 times by uh, P, which is 0.52. Keep this in your calculator. You'll need this in a second. So 15.6, that's the mean that we're going to be using times that by 0.48. So I'm choosing 0.48 because that's the probability. It's not this. And that isn't quite our standard deviation. That's our variance. I want to square root that. So it is 2.74. And I'm going to put a squared there just so we've got that. So these are, wait, is that right? That seems OK. Do, 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 do. Let me just put that in again. Oh, no, I've used N is 30. Oh, I'm such an idiot. Ignore all of that. <laughs> Our N changed a second ago. Uh, gee. Just seems very small. N is uh, meant to be 600. Reverse. Same thing, just change your N. So going all the way back to here, this should be 600. Sorry. Uh, 312, that's nice. So our 
mu is 312 because that's 600 times p and then times that by 0.48 that's going to be our variance which is quite large square root in that gives us 12.24 that's better so it's going to be 12.24 squared much better so putting that in um, that's our kind of uh, model that we're going to be using and now let's have a look at our question our question is the probability that y, it's not y, it's x at this stage, is between 350 equal to and also 300 equal to. So firstly, we want to convert that using a continuity correction to a variable y. So if I want to include 300, so again, imagine here's 300. Just below 300 is 295, whatever that's going to be, blah, 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 uh, 299, sorry. And above that is going to be uh, 301. Ignore the fact that the bars, they're not correct. But to be equal to 300, it needs to include this side here and be bigger than. So I'm going to be going from here, which is 299.5. So that's that lower continuity correction. The upper side, I want it to include 350. So to include 350, I need to include the upper end of that. So you can use a similar diagram. The upper end of 350 will take place at 350. 0.5. And these are the values we're going to be using for our y distribution. And these are the numbers as well that we're going to use. So I'm going into here. I'm going 7, then 2. The lower bound is 299.5. The upper bound is 350.5. The standard deviation itself is 12.24. And the mean is 312. Find out what that is. It's 0.8456. And that is the probability that these batteries last longer than 40 hours. So obviously the 40 hours is the constant thing here. It's just what we're looking at. Uh, so we'd expect 84.5% of these to last longer than 40 hours. Um, and that's all it is. Okay, next bit. Um, is it the harder bit? I think this is probably the harder bit, the continuity correction. The next bit is a bit nasty, but it's not the worst thing in the world. It's the hypothesis testing with the normal distribution. So the hypothesis testing here is, it is a little bit nasty, but to be fair, all we're doing here is we're testing um, the mean itself and comparing that with what the mean is found of a sample. So we take a sample, we find the mean, we compare that to the original, what the manufacturer claims, whatever else. And we just say, okay, is there a chance that this little small sample of bolts that I've taken, is there a chance it could be fluke that these are significantly less than what they should be? If the percentage is less than our um, significance level, then we can reject and say, whoa, 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 this is not fluke. The chance of this happening was so remote that this must be something different to what you've claimed. And therefore, the claim that you're putting forward is false. So in, in other words, rejecting the not. If it's within our normal range or greater than our uh, uh, level of significance, then it it's could have happened just by fluke chance. It could just be that um, the bolts we take, and it's, it's just unfortunate coincidence that these gave us a slightly less uh, mean or slightly greater than mean, um, but it's not, it's not significant enough to suggest that the claim was false, so in which case we would accept the null. Keep in mind, this doesn't tell us, always tell us which way it is, and it definitely doesn't tell us what our new mean is. It just tells us there might be some change. So that's the whole point of the hypothesis test. It's just checking for that change. So going through here, a couple of things to change, and this is where the X bar comes in. So in our actual question, we'll be told about our model, and we'll be told how that's going to be given forward. So that's normally with mu and standard deviation uh, squared. When we go to our sample, so this is a population model. That's for everything. When we get a sample, we call it X bar. So that's our sample. And we model that normally. Mu is still the same. But we take our standard deviation, our variance. So we take our standard deviation squared. And we divide that by N. And that's going to be really important for us. And the idea behind this is that if you were to take a uh, and basically sample enough of these. So if you were to take N samples of this, then over time that this would match our original 
um, normal distribution. So if you were to sample all these up, then they would become the original kind of bit. It's important to note here that if you were to use a Z, um, I suppose I, I could call it um, the Z distribution itself, then that would be X bar minus mu. But the bottom here would be sigma divided by, and then this is going to be the square root of N because normally you just get sigma or the standard deviation here. The standard deviation of this is sigma over root n, so you're just square rooting all of that. Um, so this sigma squared here, sorry, it's just talking about the top little bit, so it's sigma squared divided by n, or it's sigma over root n, all squared. So here our new sigma is this sigma over root n, and then we square it to get the variance itself. Uh, so it's important to note and to realize that. It's not often you'll need this, but if any question tries to trick you, they want to put something new in, then you can, uh, you've can you got that just in case. So for this one, we've got the mass of what we've got. Yeah, I, I don't even know where we're at here. European water, waterfalls, okay. So we've got the mass of European waterfalls, M grams, is normally distributed with standard deviation of 12 grams. Given that 2.5% of waterfalls have a mass greater than 160 grams, find the mean mass. So this is not using anything new yet. This is just testing that we can still do the previous chapters. So for part A, no test involved here. So for part A, let's just get that. So find the mean mass of a European waterfall. Um, that's, that's going back to 3.5 or whatever it was for finding mean. So here, we will uh, need to use the original. It's this Z thing, but not with the new one, it's the original one. So let's just put this down. We've got that M is modeled normally with standard deviation 12 and mean mu. So that's our first thing. We know that 22.5% of watt volts have a greater than 160. So a quick diagram just to represent that. We know that down here, we've got 160 grams. This area, see if it'll let me do it, represents 2.5%. So 2.5% is not point not, wait, yeah. Um, let's get that right, uh, 0 0.025. So one, two gives us that 2.5%. That's gonna go even smaller there, which would have been silly. Uh, that is the diagram we're looking for, and we're looking for the mean, so please, um, I just want to emphasize that this mean here, it looks like it's going to be less than 160. It should be less than 160 when we get my, our answer. Use logic to try and uh, double check that for us. So um, we know that the probability that X is greater than 160, M in this case, sorry. So M is greater than 160 is equal to 0 0.025. But we don't know enough detail about this. So let's change it to Z. So the probability that Z is greater than, now we're going to do 160 minus mu divided by 12. That's going to give us this 0 0.025. So if I find my Z value, I can say equal to this. So 160 minus mu is equal to 12. And let's just put in the inverse normal here. Keep in mind, this is bigger than. I need less than. So I'm going to put 1 minus 0 0.025. And I can put that straight in on my calculator. If calculator is smart enough to do that. The standard deviation is uh, one and the mean is zero. So that gives me 1.9599 or 1.5. Actually, it's 1.9600, isn't it, if I round that? But we'll just do a dot, dot, dot to make it easier on ourselves. 1.9599 dot, dot, dot. I'm going to times that by 12 and then rearrange to find mu. Uh, in actual fact, I'm just going to show a different skill in a calculator um, just to try and show this off. We, I'm hoping we can all do that. So I'm just going to use and show off the Casio's function of this solve and equals business. So it uses a kind of an iterative process to solve this. So it can only use X, but I can still show it. So we've got 160 minus X, and that is, I should have put brackets in first, all divided by 12, and that equals, so I'm going to use this red equals, alpha equals, get in the right place. And that equals 1.9599. I think it was a six, we'll leave it like that for now. So when it rounds, 
All I want to do now is I want to ask the calculator to solve this function by using this yellow solve. So I press shift solve. This is a numerical solving uh, strategy. Um, and I just choose a value which I think it might be around. I know it's less than 160, so I'm just going to choose 150. And it'll just help speed my calculator up. I press equals, and it'll tell me that x is 136.48. And I'm just going to put that down. So 136.48. I did none of the work there apart from coding my calculator, which is fantastic. Um, but just in case you do want to see it properly done, um, if I times through by 12, so I take my 1.9599 and times that by 12. And then what I want to do is do 160 minus the answer. And you'll see it's 136.48. Uh, so just by rearranging that equation. So that's a couple of ways of doing that for us. Part B, um, we're told that eight waterfalls are chosen at random, um, and we want to find the probability that at least four have a mass greater than 150. So we choose these eight waterfalls. I feel like we're holding a great waterfall election here. So we've got eight of them. We need to check um, that at least four, what's the probability that at least four have a mass greater than 150? Um... Hmm. Let's find the probability that one has a mass greater than 150. So I feel like this is some kind of hidden question in here. Um, notice we're choosing eight and we want at least four. That to me sounds like binomial distribution normally. So we normally do that we've got these voles and we've got eight of them. And if we knew what probability one was, we can then kind of find out what's the probability of x being at least four being greater than. So what's the probability that we've got at least four, so greater than or equal to four? Um, but we don't know this probability. This probability we can find by just imagining this question is a normal distribution question to find that probability. So we'll come to that in just a second. So let's do the probability that m is greater than 150. So that's just a one mark question on our calculator. So we go to seven and we go to uh, normal CD. Lower bound is 150, upper bound just whacking a big number. Uh, the standard deviation was 12 and the mean we've just found is 136.48. So the probability of one of these being greater than 150 grams is 0.1299. So that's for any particular vol. And remember a binomial distribution and um, that's got four conditions we need to meet. Firstly, do we have a fixed number of participants? Yes, we've got eight. Are they all independent of each other? Yes, in this case, one vol won't affect the mass of another vol, and they're completely independent of each other. Number three, are there only two conditions, true and false? Yes, they can either be greater than 150, or they can not be greater than 150. And I can't remember the fourth one offhand because I can't remember the others that we've said. Um, so we've done fixed, fixed trials is done. Fixed probability. So is it a fixed probability? Yes, it is. We've just found that. Uh, so the probability of any of these happening, we've just found. So we're going to use a normal, a, a binomial distribution. So let's just take a, we choose M uh, or we, we had M. Let's just call it Y for now then. So Y is modeled binomially. We've got eight voles, and each chance is 0.1299. And we want to know what's the probability that Y, so that's the chance that one of them is bigger than 150. What's the chance that we can get four of them, at least four? So to have at least four, that means that we need to have four or more. And that is equal to, if it needs to be greater than or equal to four, then we want to know one minus the probability that it's um, less than or equal to three. Because remember on our calculator, we can only put less than or equal to four binomials. So I go to binomial uh, CD because it's a um, inequality that we're using. We go variable, X is three, the number is eight and the probability is 0.1299. So everything just coming straight from here. That's 0.987. We want one minus that. 
which is equal to 0.0129. And that's our final answer for that. That's the probability that at least four of these out of the eight will have a mass greater than 150 grams. So it's mixing that up, a little bit of a harder kind of question. You can see that because they've got eight and they want four out of these eight, it's kind of like a, a four choose, a, a, an eight choose four problem, um, looking like binomial prob probability. So we need to use that because there's so many different options. Part C, uh, European water rats have mass n grams. Oh, fantastic. Um, which is normally distributed with standard deviation 85. Let's just put this over here. A random sample of 15 water rats is taken and the sample mean mass is found to be 875 grams. Stating your hypothesis clearly and using a 10% level of significance, test whether the mean mass of all water rats is different from 860 grams. So this is telling us that we want to assume that the mean is 8, 860. I don't know why they've told us that in the final part of this question. I'm going to start to see up here. So this is saying that we've got these water rats themselves, so N, let's say, that's modelled by mean of 860, and they're telling us that we had a standard deviation of 85. So this is the usual model. Now we want to take a sample. So I want to come up with the sample model. So N bar is 860, that stays the same. But remember, to get this part, we just do whatever it is divided by N. So having a look in our sample, we took 15. So it's going to be 85 squared over 15. But that is our variance. So we're going to have to be careful when we put that into our calculator. You might want to find just to the side here that implies that mu is 860 and that standard deviation, let's just bring that calculator back up, is 85 squared divided by 15 and then just square root in that. Whoop. So that gives us 21.95 or 0.947, let's go. There we go. So that's the uh, kind of first part. I'm just putting these here so when I use that. Let's have a look at our hypothesis test then. So we've got a few things to write down here. So H0, that's our null hypothesis, is that the mean is 860. So we want to check to see if that's remaining unchanged. And our alternative hypothesis is that mu is not 860. So we want to check that it's not changed from it. So it could have gone up, it could have gone down. That implies this is what we call a two-tailed test. So if it's two-tailed, we need to work out what the level of significance is, or alpha, as we call it. Um, and that's going to be in each tail. So if it's 10% overall, we want 5% in each tail, which is 0.05. So that's going to be our level of significance. It's checking here to test. Um, yeah, it's just going through and we want to just double check to see what's happening here. So we want to check if this is going to be less than 0.05. If it is, then we fail and we reject. If it's not, then we accept. Um, and that's all we're looking for. So what we're going to do here is double check. Uh, what is the kind of chance of, yeah, just kind of this being greater than so the random kind of mass is 875. So what is the chance of N being that or greater than? So what's the probability that N is greater than, and it's N hat, sorry, or um, is greater than 875? Almost forgotten what I was saying. So we're choosing 875 because it comes from the question, and that's what our sample mean was, um, was found. So we want to check what's the probability that it was actually equal to that or greater than that, um, and check to see if this is a fluke occurrence. So I go into number seven, and I'm going to go into normal CD. The lower limit is 875. The upper limit is a bazillion. Um, remember, you just actually wanted to choose that to be um, 860 plus five lots of this 21. Um, I'm just using a big number just so I don't have to do the math there. The standard deviation is 21.947, and the mean is 860. So what's the probability? If this probability comes out to be less than 0 0.05, we will have sufficient evidence to suggest that their mean weight is different. Otherwise, we've not got enough evidence to suggest um, that, it has, that it is different from this 860. 0 0.247. 
That's way higher than what I was expecting it to be. Uh, 0.2472. As 0.2472 is bigger than 0.05, then we can't reject it. So we need to accept. So we accept H0 or the null. Um, you want to now put a line about what, like what this means. So there is insufficient or not sufficient. So there is insufficient evidence. If I can write. And then just look at what it's asking you to test. Um, it's test whether the mean mass of all water rats is different. You're just going to copy that out. So there is insufficient, insufficient evidence to suggest. And then just copy that sentence out. That the mean mass of all water rats, and this is the worst part about this, it's just writing, and you can tell I hate writing here, uh, is different from 860 grams. Full stop, job done. I've got one more question based on um, just a random one from the uh, review exercise actually that I dug, dug out. Um, which is on the next page here. So I'll do one more just to wrap things up. On I, I've chosen it on normal distribution. I don't know completely which ones it tests. All I know is it's quite long. So I'm just going to have a quick drink and we'll crack on. So let's have a quick read of this. For a particular type of plant, 45% have white flowers and the remainder have coloured flowers. Garden Mania sells plants in batch of 12. A batch is selected at random. Great. Calculate the probability this batch contains exactly five plants with white flowers, more plants with white flowers than colored ones. And then I'm not going to read the rest from there. So there's quite a, quite a lot to read from here. So let's check, first of all, what type of distribution we're looking at here. So we want to know exactly five plants with white flowers. So that sounds to me like they either do have white flowers or they don't have white flowers. So they've got two outcomes. That is suggesting or suggestive of a, a binomial distribution. So that's where I'm going to start here. Uh, we're not told anything about the actual uh, flowers themselves, but we do know we're looking for white flowers. So I'm going to use W as being my variable. So W itself is the number of white plants or number of white flowers. So white flower plants. And that therefore means I can use W uh, to binomially. And then from here, we know it's 45% and we've got 12 flowers. So 12 and 0.45. So that's the problem. That's the uh, distribution we're gonna be using for each of these. We want to know for part A, what is the probability that W is exactly five? And for part B, we want to know what is the probability that more plants with white flowers than colored ones. Um, how can we think about that one then? So if they were equal and we had six uh, and we had 12, it'd be six and six, wouldn't it? So we'd have six and six, so white and colored. We want more white then colors, so that must be seven, that must be five. So we want to be greater than or equal to seven. So again, just think about that logically to get the outcome there, let's get rid of that. Um, so for that one, there's a little bit of thinking in there. From there, it's just whacking your calculator. So number seven, first one is an equals, so you want a PD and list, so that is equal to five. Uh, we've got 12 and 0.45. So 0.2224. I'll change that to a five at the end just by rounded. And then the second one, and that's going to be greater than or equal to seven. So that's one minus the probability that we have less than or equal to six. So remember, you can't do greater than, so you've got to do less than. Um, and for this one, because we're using a inequality, it is in fact a CD. So you need to go down to that CD one. And we'll put six in. Rest is already saved from before, and we want one minus that. So one takeaway this, the way to do that quickly on a calculator is to, wherever you want to get up to, add the digits up to nine. So one minus seven, uh, like if I want seven, I want seven plus what is nine. So it's not point, and then 
seven, seven plus two, so it's a two, three plus six, nine plus zero, and three. I'm going to count this as my last one now, so I want to round this. So I'm going to make this equal to 10. So that's a seven at the end. Um, so you can try that if you want yourself, but if you try and do that minus 0 0.7393, 0 minus 3, you'd have to borrow, and then borrow, and then borrow, and then borrow. So we get like that. 10 minus 3 is 7. 9 minus 9 is 0. 9 minus 3 is 6. And then this is a 9 minus 7 is 2. So you can see it does work. Um, it's the same answer. But there's little tricks for most things in maths. That's just the one that I use quite regularly. Uh, that's it for part B. Part C, then, we've got a bit more information. It tells us that garden mania takes a random sample of 10 batches of plants. So this time we've got a random sample of 10 batches. What now? Um, find the probability that exactly three of these batches contains more plants with white flowers than colored ones. So this looks like it relates to part B because it's got this more plants with white than colored. So the probability of having more plants with white than colored is 0 0.2607. So now we're, we're actually looking for the probability. Let's just do a new thing. Let's call it W prime for now. Um, and W prime is the probability of more white than colored. Um, and that's modeled binomially. We've got batch of 10 and our new probability is 0 0.2607. And I want to know what's the probability that I have exactly three. So what's the probability that W prime is three? So I'm just going to put that in on here. There are formulas that you can use. I'm going to use a PD, a variable, and it's three with n is 10 and probability is 0 0.2607. So it's 0.2567. And then lastly, D, due to an increase in demand for these plants by large companies, Garden Mini decides to sell them in batches of 150. Great stuff. Got to buy loads of flowers. Use a suitable approximation to calculate the probability that a batch of 150 plants contains more than 75 with white flowers. Oh. So this one, it looks like we're going back again uh, to white flowers. Uh, and we know that white flowers is 0 0.45. So this is, yeah, going back to W themselves. So we, we had W being, uh, let's just write this down, binomially with, and this time we're doing 150, but our probability is 0 0.45. So that's kind of what we had. That means that W hat, no, W hat is hypothesis. Stop doing that. Let's say uh, Y is normally distributed by this times this. Which is 67.5. So that's NP. And the other one, we want to times that by 0 0.55 because that's the probability of not being white or not having white flowers. And then we want to square root that. And the reason we're square rooting that is for the standard deviation to make it clear. So it's 6.09 squared just so we've got that. So this is a normal approximation. Don't forget your continuity correction. Um, so that's going to be really important for us in this particular question. Uh, I'll do most of it just over the side. So I'm going to cover up most of this front part, and I'm just going to do it over this side. So what is the question actually saying? It's saying, what's the probability that X, which is our batch of the flowers, is greater than 75? Uh, I'm saying X. It's not X. It's W because that's what I called it. So what's the probability that W, so the white flower is greater than 75? We need to convert that to Y. So what's the probability that Y, now we want it to be greater than 75, so not include in 75. So again, here's my discrete, that's my 75. The next one is my 76 and so forth. I want it to be bigger than 75, so not including it, it can't touch this box. So that number right there, that bound is 75.5. So always thinking about that for the con continuity correction. With that, we just want to now work it out. So sticking it in our calculator. So we're going to go for a normal. And we want normal CD, 
with a lower bound of 75.5 and an upper bound of one gazillion ish um our normal uh, uh, whatever that is standard deviation is 6.09 and our mean is 67.5 and it's 0.9448 so let's just write that out properly so 0.0945 we'll go with usually speaking we'll go to four decimal places and call it 3sf whichever way but that is that question complete i don't have any more in here i think the next page is blank let's just have a quick look yeah so that is the last question i've got for today got any questions um apologies for a few mistakes in there um if you find any others just let me know um i think i've clarified everything in there but if you do find anything that's a little bit confusing just let me know hopefully that helps thank you very much